Go action and I'm ready to go. Go action. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. And I want to especially thank um, uh, Scott um, uh, Ludwig and um, Kevin Ludwig and Scott Greeson. And uh, I really love it like Vicki for um, providing some music for us today. So uh, this is being recorded. Uh, Jim Walker, I want to thank Jim Walker and uh, Shanta Marsh and the Tube Factory and Big Car. Uh, Jim Walker uh, is with WQRT, which is a program of Big Car Collaborative and broadcast from uh, Listen Here in Garfield Park, which is 90, let's see here, which is 24-7 uh, and uh, it's 99.1 FM. So uh, thank you very much for recording this and we look forward to uh, tuning in and, and hopefully he edits out all the uh, mistakes. My name is Avon Waters and I want to thank you for coming here today. Um, the um, project today is in uh, collaboration with uh, many people, uh, Art uh, Nature Consortium is the nonprofit that uh, is putting on the program um, or the project called Indiana Waterways, the Art of Conservation. Now that, let me give you some background before we do our readings. We have essays here who are going to be doing readings for you. And I want to give you some background about how this, um, this collaboration all started with uh, A and C and uh, the, the five artists. When COVID hit, anybody remember COVID-19? <laughs> yes. All right, and what were we? We were stuck in our houses. Okay, by the summer and spring of 2020, COVID-19 had shut down many of the uh, public facing events. And I'm one of these Indiana plein air uh, artist painters, they call them like that. And we always had events once or twice a month and our big event that draws hundreds of people uh, in the spring was canceled. Then the next one was canceled. And pretty soon then we got to get out a little bit in the summer, but then they started saying, COVID's coming back. COVID's coming back. You're going to be stuck inside again. So four of my friends, artist friends and I, got together and decided, okay, we don't know how long we're going to be stuck inside, how many things are going to be canceled. So what we did as artists, we said, you know, as individuals, we can go out and we can paint. And no matter whether we get out and the public facing events come back or it opens up next year or whatever, we can develop um, uh, some sharing online. Which, anybody here share online? Anybody know what Zoom meetings are now? Okay, yeah, all right. So we took some of that out, but we were still wanted to paint outside. I mean, we were outdoor painters. So we got together in the fall of 2020 and decided to do this art project. And then when we're sitting there, it's like, well, let's just let's more than have one exhibit. Let's see if we can get uh, a touring of these art pieces. Let's do one hundred art pieces. Then it's like, let's not just have a book of art. Let's find a way to add writing to it. And let's make it more than just visual art, let's make it literary arts. And so that's how the introduction of this publication that you see um, uh, on the back of this book that's been published. It has the 100 paintings that, by the way, 60 of them open up today at the Indiana State Museum. And that exhibit opens today and goes through December 11th. And then once it closes, we move it to Fort Wayne Museum of Art. And all 100 pieces will be in, uh, through January through March. Then it goes to Miniaturista Museums and Gardens. And if you aren't familiar with Miniaturista, Miniaturista is um, um, a, a museum that is associated with several mansions that used to be in the Ball family. Anybody do canning? Canning, you've ever heard of ball jars? Well, that's the family from ages ago that uh, that foundation now funds many, many art events and helps with miniaturists and the community around the 
Then it goes down to the southern Indiana. Uh, we go to the New Harmony Museum or uh, Gallery, uh, which is the future salon in New Harmony, the little boot of Indiana. But this today, this today is the uh, focus on the writers and a chance for them to do readings um, from their essays. There's three essays. And when we got together as artists, we said, we all had different styles. And so we wanted the writing not to be like somebody else continued chapter two and chapter three. We wanted the writing to be different genres also. So what we found is we found some uh, environmental writers that uh, were able to fit that bill. And um, I will give a longer introduction to each of them, but if you would raise your hand, uh, I would appreciate it. Uh, we have uh, Jerry Sweeten back there, Dr. Jerry Sweeten. And we have um, uh, Jason, Jason Goldsmith here. And we have um, uh, Carson Gerber over here. And each of them did an essay for this book. And uh, what, what I want you to realize is that when you go to the cereal aisle, you know, there's not one cereal, there's like many. And we all have different tastes, and so this was our approach with the art. The art is all about Indiana rivers, and we wanted to make the writing become about the conservation of those rivers, and we used the art kind of like clickbait, and you ever heard of clickbait? But we're gonna use the art like clickbait or uh, eye candy to get people interested, and then they'll learn about these essays on conservation. And each one of these essays uh, focuses on something different. We tried one of the genres we had is reportage, which is the traditional, the person who likes the cereal very plain, I want my cornflakes, I want my milk, I want my sugar. Give me the facts, is reportage. Then um, Dr. Sweeten, he did this uh, wonderful piece that uses the memoir uh, format. Now, as soon as I told you that he was uh, Dr. Jerry Sweeten in her biology, she thought, oh, oh, I'm back into my college biology lecture. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're going to be in for a treat. And Jason, Jason is um, a wonderful um, creative writer, and so he did a creative nonfiction um, piece. So um, today's event, like I said, is made possible by the Indiana Humanities. And for those of you that have been around a while, you may remember the Indiana Humanities Council. So Indiana Humanities is um, providing a grant for this. And for the entire project, we relied on many grants, uh, one of which was the Isaac Walton League of um, the Indiana Division. And another is the Indiana um, Arts Commission. So those grants have helped us uh, do this. But more importantly, there's probably almost 100 individual people who gave small donations and large donations up to $1,000 each, which also helped make all this possible. So um, I have to, I would be amiss if I didn't get Susan Bevel from Butler. Uh, she, uh, her Susan, for my um, uh, master's uh, project, uh, I had gone to one of her uh, readings and a workshop. And so when I needed writers, I contact Susan, and then she says, You know, I can write a grant to the humanities and maybe help. And she did, and so that's why we're here today. So thank you very much, Susan. Let's begin with our first essay. Let me, um, what I'll do is, uh, after each essay is, kind of, uh, is done, uh, they'll have a seat and I'll come up and introduce and give you a little bit more detail about the next essays. Our first essay is, is Jason Goldsmith. Uh, he's the author of many creative nonfiction stories, as I said, many focused on nature. He has been a professor at Butler University for the past 17 years. And before that, uh, he had an opportunity to work with industries that gave him a very unique 
unique perspective on the challenges to conserve our natural resources. So let's give uh, Jason a warm welcome and uh, we'll begin.
situated at the confluence of the Maumee and St. Joseph Rivers, Kekiamba, present-day Fort Wayne, was their largest capital village for generations and a strategic portage connecting Lake Erie to the Mississippi. But the river did more than just provide physical sustenance. It formed the core of Miami cultural identity. Their origin story begins at first the Miami came out of the water. The river thus functions as a spiritual and formative marker of tribal identity, closely linking the people to the river's life-giving waters. As Miami historian Scott Shoemaker puts it, the river is the narrative of the people. Although the dominant group in central and northern Indiana, the Miami were not alone. The land we now call Indiana, land of the Indians, was populated by numerous Native American tribes during the period of European contact. Miami, we, Piankasha, Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Shawnee, and more coexisted. The land did not belong to the people. Rather, the people belonged to the land. Each nation flourished within a central region surrounded by permeable and often overlapping peripheries. Less essential to a tribe's sustenance, these peripheries were negotiated through intermarriage and trade that bound the tribes in relationships of reciprocity. In general, neighbors were relatives, and the tribes used kinship terms to refer to them. Warfare, when it occurred, was often ritualized to minimize the loss of life. <clears throat> The Miami invited the Lenni Lenape, the original people, to settle along the White River's banks around 1770. The Lenape had been forced out of their traditional territory on the mid-Atlantic coast by successive waves of settlers. And although their time in Indiana would be curtailed by further Euro-American incursion, about 2,000 Lenape established 14 villages on the West Fork of the White River. Curtis Zuniga, who is the tribal operations manager of the Delaware tribe, has noted how through these moves, water always remains central to Lenape tribal identity. And here I'm quoting him. A lot of our moves pursuant to treaties and agreements, we always sought out the water first. That's part of the enduring legacy of the Lenape people, that wherever they did move, they began to have an affinity with a relationship with the river. With 14 chiefs and a great man, the Lenape had the largest presence at the signing of the Treaty of Greenville, the 1795 Treaty, which opened the Ohio Valley to white settlers while reserving most of Indiana for Native Americans. In ceding the lands of Ohio and establishing the Greenville Line, the tribes sought to protect themselves from further encroachment. But it didn't work out that way. Border conflicts and illegal settlement by squatters and speculators continued. Once established, these illegal communities would call on the federal government to protect them from reprisals by the tribes, who sought to maintain legitimate control of land long theirs and designated so by treaty. In response, the government would send irregular militias and federal troops to violently suppress resistance. The historical record shows that these troops indiscriminately slaughtered women and children. They burned indigenous villages and fields. What Greenville really marked was the beginning of a series of treaties and land sessions designed to drive the indigenous peoples off their lands by any means necessary. George Washington expressed this scorched earth policy when commanding one of his generals, quote, to lay waste all the settlements around, that the country may not be merely overrun, but destroyed. You will not by any means listen to any overture of peace before the total ruin of their settlements is effected." End quote. And I can repeat numerous instances of our presidents and leaders expressing this kind of sentiment. We have never truly come to terms with the brutal legacy of settler colonialism, a policy of genocide and dispossession pursued by 
by a government eager to take indigenous land at any cost. It is a legacy that continues in our ongoing treatment of Native Americans to this day. But settler colonialism did more than just remove people from the land. It fundamentally altered the relationship between people and non-human others. The removal of the Miami, the Potawatomi, the Lenape, and other tribes had a drastic impact on human environmental relations. Once understood as a shared, sacred space, the land became a discrete commodity to be bought, sold, and transformed. For the Miami, the land was a partner, a gift from the creator that informed who they were, shaping their history and cosmology. It was the place they buried their ancestors. It sustained life. It was land held in common. Throughout Indiana, the Miami established summer villages along streams and rivers where they planted crops in the fertile soil of floodplains and had access to the flora and fauna of a complex riparian ecosystem. They lit seasonal fires, clearing the undergrowth through prescribed burns, working in concert with the land. In contrast, the Euro-American arrivals ignored fundamental interspecies relationships and failed to respect the integrity of the ecosystems they entered. The land was cleared, turned, and tilled. The forest was cut down, and wetlands were reclaimed to create arable agricultural lands. Streams were channelized. Trees were cleared along the rivers. Without shade, the water temperature increased. The banks, no longer secured by roots, began to erode. Sediment loads increased, covering mussel beds and fish spawning grounds. Animal and agricultural waste from tilled fields entered the waterways, decreasing the quality of aquatic habitats. Biological diversity collapsed as numerous species were extirpated. Mills and slaughterhouses dumped waste material. Sewage from expanding towns made its way into feeder streams and creeks. Prior to the arrival of settlers, the White River ran clean through mostly hardwood forest. The Miami called it Wapahani, white sands, for the sparkling limestone visible through its clear waters. After just one generation of settlers, the White River was muddied. In those 100 years, settlers transformed the landscape that had taken 10,000 years to develop. In 1850, Governor Joseph Wright proudly boasted to the General Assembly, quote, we are an agricultural people. Our climate, soil, and situation make it so, end quote. <coughs> He was wrong. We made it so. We would be wrong to think of the indigenous peoples as historic presences. Despite the removals, native peoples remained on these lands. The Miami families of Richardsville and Godfrey have maintained a continuous presence here, while many descendants of those who were removed have returned to the area. What would it mean to connect with the indigenous communities living here now? To start, we would need to acknowledge a history of injustice, as well as the social and economic structures that perpetuate those injustices. This is difficult, but necessary. Settler colonial logic <coughs> has limited our understanding of the river. Now, more than ever, we need to learn from those who know the land as something more than just a commodity. Those for whom the land is an essential part of their very being. Even after all these years, Shoemaker attests, quote, the rivers continue to play an important role in the lives and indigenous identity of the contemporary Indiana Miami people, end quote. <clears throat> the Chickasaw novelist Linda Hogan is right when she says, Indian people must not be the only ones who remember the agreement with the land, the sacred pact to honor and care for the life that in turn provides for us. But any vision for the future of Indiana's waterways must include a commitment to the original inhabitants who lived and who continue to live within their watersheds. 
we need to collaborate with indigenous communities to partner with black communities as well. In turning to indigenous ways of knowing and being, though, we must be mindful not to repeat the pattern of appropriation and dispossession that has long characterized settler-native relations. That's not easy, by the way. The ecological crisis is an incontrovertible fact, but it is also a crisis of culture and of Western culture specifically. In this sense, we can understand the crisis as embedded in the stories we tell, the art we make, the songs we sing. Can we tell new stories that open different ways of knowing the world? Is it possible to paint ecologically? And what might that even mean? If the point of this waterways project is to highlight ecological peril and the significance of waterways to our communities, we need it to do more than just represent scenes. We look at a work of art framed and isolated as a discrete object, and we appreciate its beauty. We might even yearn to visit the place depicted. But if we simply attend to its surface, the immediate moment of encounter, us in the art, we will fail to appreciate the land represented as anything more than mere scenery. What if, instead, we were to see each painting as one instant in a passage of time, a single frame of a moving picture? This would be to enter a different relationship to the land, to adopt a different way of seeing and knowing. What if we were to treat the work like a river, to wonder what lies below the surface? Moreover, to consider the river not as a border or an edge, but as the center of a watershed, a gathering place toward which an entire region pours itself. I wonder if this might be a step toward indigenizing our thinking, an insufficient step, of course, but a step nonetheless. To take this step would be to recognize our moment as but one in a long history, to acknowledge and account for that history. I think my impulse was right, to seek the river to know the place, but the way I went about it was wrong. My desire to paddle the length of the river was colonial, a way to map unfamiliar territory, to tame the unknown. We've practiced this approach to great devastation. These days, I want a different relationship to the river. What I'm trying to say, I think, is that we can never really know the thing itself. It will forever be other. And really, the river doesn't mean simply is. We need to sit with the river, not to discover some deep truth about it, but rather to recognize that the river is never alone. Only then can we situate the river and the tree and the heron, ourselves, our neighbors, within the world of which each one is an indelible part. We need to see relationships rather than objects. But modern life is busy. Burdened with worries and anxieties, we turn to yoga or meditation to still our minds and connect with the present moment. And this is good practice. There is a cost, though, to living too much in the moment. In so doing, we fail to recognize that moment in its unfolding as extending beyond our present. Our presence. We must begin to cultivate a different sense of time to realize that each moment is but one of a multitude inextricably woven together. Perhaps our understanding can take the shape of the river, ever-changing, fed by innumerable streams, drifting through different terrains and communities, shaped by and shaping the land, its lazy riffles and surging rapids, its hidden depths, the play of light and shadow across its surface.